congratulations on making it here. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daniel Garifas Holland, and I'm the first speaker for Palo Alto GS, Garifas Holland and Shetty. We're going to be debating on the affirmative today, and thank you guys all for coming out and watching our finals round. Hopefully, it'll be entertaining. All right, let's see. Thank you, speech. <laughs> Maybe we should have done it after the round. But. All right, let's see. So, a couple quick thank yous, of course. Thank you to my parents for encouraging my interest in debate and allowing me to travel and come to these tournaments and judge and support all my endeavors, paying to fly south to Kentucky, down here to San Diego, everything like that. I want to say thank you to my partner, Yes Shetty. We just started being partners this year, and we've done so much together. Qualified at TOC, come here to States, and gotten all the way to finals. I've appreciated your help so much. He's always stuck with me, even when I'm annoying. And we've, we've learned so much and grown so much as debaters. And I wish you great luck in college in Boston. Um, uh, in terms of debate friends, I want to say thank you to all of the debaters here who've been so nice and, and made this tournament so fun and entertaining. Science, Sienna and Daniel, our lovely opponents, Dory Valley, although I think they've gone home, and everyone else um, I've hung out with and talked to at this tournament. Um, I want to say thank you to a couple of other debate friends who are not here at this tournament right now. Um, some of the teams I'm very close with, in, uh, Overlake CL, Fiona Lee, American RK, Arthi, um, Anshal, Notre Dame BC, who have been amazing at this tournament, and it's unfortunate that they can't be here with us in finals, although we love you guys too. Um, and thank you to everyone who supported me along this journey. Thank you to our coaches at Palo Alto, Kyle Heidela, Arjun Maheshwari, and Claire Beamer, as well as all the other coaches who have supported us along the way. Um, that should be all. Hopefully I didn't forget anyone. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> my time will begin on my first word. Palo Alto affirms, our sole contention is the destruction of liberties. This occurs on three levels. First is domestic. We haven't yet ended the racial caste system in America, merely redesigned it. Mass incarceration turns people into permanent second-class citizens, according to Alexander Tan, similar to Jim Crow. Once labeled a felon, employment discrimination, housing discrimination, denial of the right to vote are suddenly legal. Our prison population has increased sevenfold in less than 30 years, and biometrics are fanning the flames. V22 finds that surveillance tech enables precise discrimination as law enforcement makes predictive decisions around marginalized populations. FRT, or facial recognition technology, drastically enlarged the scope of surveillance, and this is cyclical. McDonald 20 finds that face analysis is a feedback loop. Researchers build tech, sell the tech to police, and police use it to justify arrests. Finally, mugshots are used to improve algorithms. A ban is necessary for any type of progress on this issue. Surreal 20 finds that high-tech surveillance helps drive brutal policing. The Department of Homeland Security, or DHS, has spied on protesters using drone surveillance. Unchecked facial recognition is one of police's most powerful tools, and it's rooted in racist eugenics. Prohibiting police access is required to defend black lives in the 21st century. Action is an ethical imperative, as Ansel 17 finds that the deadliest violence exists when some groups have access to resources, including health and life itself. Violence is built into the very rules that govern our society. This is called structural violence and should be preferred over any other impact in the round. It destroys the lives of others through suffering, poverty, ill health, and violence. And each year, more than 60,000 black people die prematurely simply because of inequality. Second is foreign. Inter uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, is now a surveillance agency. OMS 22 finds that ICE uses facial recognition for immigration enforcement and spent $96 million on biometrics, including fingerprints and DNA testing. There are no regulations whatsoever addressing their use of this technology, and this translates directly to deportation of undocumented immigrants. Pittman 11 finds that ICE sends fingerprint and name information through a federal file sharing system, where it's checked against FBI criminal records. This has led to 1 million individuals arrested who are not US citizens. The program eliminates the ability of detainees to lie about their name or country of origin and seek asylum in the United States. And deportations are soon to triple. Lamont's 22 finds that in 2011, the ICE program of biometrics had only 1,210 jurisdictions, but they aim to have all 3,141 soon. Conditions are dehumanizing in these detention centers, as Nelson Seitin finds that anti-immigrant sentiment has radicalized ICE, emboldening it to employ increased violence and arrest with impunity. ICE agents have committed facial medical neglect and abuse of minors. Incremental reforms often offer little relief in the face of state-sanctioned violence. 
the immigration industrial complex draws parallels with mass incarceration, and statistics alone can capture the true scope of violence in ICE detention. Third is global. Democracy worldwide is in free fall. As Walsh 21 finds, the world is in a democratic recession, with democracy worsening in 73 countries. The US and its allies were responsible for an outsized share of global democratic backsliding. China has begun to fill in. Benny M18 finds that China is exporting facial recognition to the leaders on the fence about democratic norms. Strongmen in places like Turkey, Hungary, Egypt, and Rwanda seek these tools and use them to thwart civil society and crush dissent in ways that weaken democracy globally. America, unfortunately, is following suit. China leads the world in exporting facial recognition, and there is growing bipartisan interest in restricting this Chinese technology worldwide. However, the US is the second largest exporter of facial recognition technology, which risks undermining the idea that American technology embodies democracy. A ban is key, as Hartsog 18 finds that facial recognition is perfectly suited for authoritarian control. It is the most dangerous surveillance mechanism ever invented. A ban is needed, because authoritarianism spills over. Sherman 19 finds that China and Russia and the US have influenced digital authoritarianism by example setting. People look to the United States on what to do, and millions of lives hang in the balance. Rosto 5 finds that the probability of civil war increases by a factor of 16 in highly progressive countries, which have killed over, two, uh, over 100 million people during the 20th century. For these reasons, we strongly urge an affirmative vote. So before I start, I want to give a few quick thank yous. So um, first, my name is Daniel Zhao. Um, by the way, just called the judges. But thank you first to Chasla for hosting a great tournament. It was rel run relatively on time, and it was a great experience. Um, I want to thank you to my parents um, for their financial and also emotional support. I couldn't do it without them, and they're like really the biggest supporting force in my life. I love them so much. Um, then I also want to thank Sienna's parents because Sienna's parents like drove us this tournament, for example, like helped us all this way, made sure our flights were arranged for all the tournaments we have this year. Um, I wasn't very organized with flights, so Sienna's parents made that really possible, and I really appreciate Mrs. Vaughn especially for doing all the work planning our flights. Um, I also want to thank all of our coaches. I want to thank Coach Dalton, Coach Maggie, Coach Anna, and Coach S, Coach Edward, Coach Isaac, and our private coach Gabe. I thank you so much for all of your help and all your support along the way. Um, I also want to thank our team. A lot of names, so I'm gonna say them a little fast, um, but I assure you, I love each and every one of you. Um, Hannah, Amanda, Daniel, Choi, Ava, Chase, Ben, Caitlin, Alex, Sam, Emma, Casey, Isaac, Finley, Rashad, Arden, and so many more, um, which uh, I do not have on this list right now. But, and then um, also everyone who helped prep with us too. Um, I wanna thank Caleb, Arnold, Ahmad, Plato, uh, Brady, and Salvik, Heritage, Evan, Odin, Sharp, and Ethan. All of you have been great supporting forces and we couldn't do this without you. Um, lastly, I wanna thank, um, my partner, Sienna. Um, Sienna has stuck with me through it all. We've been debating together since eighth grade. And through that, I mean, we're juniors right now, so that's, I don't know, four years. And we've had a few disagreements along the way, but through it all, we've stuck together. Um, we've resolved our differences, and um, we're still partners, which is pretty amazing considering the fights we've had. But um, with that being said, um, uh, thank you so much for listening to my thank yous. And also, um, thank you, Palos Altos. I well, think it's going to be a wonderful debate that we can have. Um, sending the case doc right now, let me leave it. You can start. Once you send it, you can start. Yeah, sure. Anyone not ready to judge? Perfect. And with that being said, time will begin now. Sienna and I negate the resolution, and contention one is innovation. By measure for the future, and according to a report by Verif in 2023 from finance, national security, even artificial intelligence, biometrics are becoming integrated into every part of modern technology. Indeed, Cancer 22 finds that although 10 years ago biometrics seemed like science fiction, that people everywhere were unlocking their phones with their faces, and the appetite with any biometrics is significant with 86% consumer approval. With increased demand comes better technology, as FRN22 writes that biometrics are rapidly advancing, producing groundbreaking accuracy to eliminate previous racial biases and other ethical concerns. Specifically, biometrics are changing the game in two arenas. The first is healthcare. In cancer research, Russo explains a novel, rapid, non-invasive biometric screening methodology to detect molecular signatures of breast cancer from a single swipe of a fingerprint. The pain-free nature of this test will likely increase screening and survival rates, with Swire in 23 quantifying a 97.8% accuracy rate. Moreover, to fight the next pandemic, Stewart 23 finds that biometrics in tantrum with artificial intelligence will be used for early detection, patient screening, and public safety monitoring using advanced biometric sensors capable of detecting high temperatures and other symptoms. The second arena of innovation is counterterrorism. 
Crab 22 finds that Biden is putting more effort to drone strikes, but the inaccuracy of drone strikes has been devastating consequences in the Middle East. Day 15 quantifies that nearly 90% of people killed in airstrikes meant for terrorist leaders were not the intended targets. And Bergen 18 confirms that only one out of every seven U.S. drone attacks killed a militant leader. The solution is biometrics. As Rollenberg 21 explains, they can be used to make clear distinctions between civilians and combatants. And Jeffrey 23 finds that Air Force patient recognition is, in drones is 99% accurate. Domestically, Red Cross 22 writes that biometrics have been used to capture 1,700 threats to U.S. security. And Gorman 11 finds that biometrics could have stopped 9-11 if implemented earlier. Because terrorism destroys national economy, stability, and safety, authors Johnson, Berlin, Larson, and Hannah all agree that terrorism threatens the lives of millions. Fortunately, an innovative world where biometrics, biometrics have been used has resulted in GTI 23 quantifying a reduction of terrorism since 30, uh, 38% since 2015. Contention 2 is conceding the race. Although there are valid concerns with biometrics, the answer is not to ban them in their entirety. Instead, Crawford 19 finds slow state-level and municipal regulations around biometrics are resolving ethicality issues and effectively working as a testing ground for national policy. Already, Crawford continues, dozens of states have passed policies surrounding patient recognition to address the harms, including privacy concerns. Even better, Lowe's 22 finds that tech companies are equally cooperating with regulations and actively improving technology to align with the public interest. However, Roberts 22 laments an outright ban will kill this progress while halting innovation. But worse, banning biometrics would remove America from the global conversation and allow China to develop biometric technologies unchallenged. While some might blindly hope that other countries would follow America in banning biometrics, BI21 finds that this thinking is wishfully ignorant. For countries all around the world, the potential benefits of biometrics are far too great for them to even consider this. And FRN continues that China remains the US's chief rival in defining the future of technology and aims to hijack global ethical standards. To ensure biometrics are viewed with US values of freedom, security, and privacy, we must promote the development in America, where regulations are influenced by US democratic legislation. However, if America was to ban biometrics, it would be a bow to China, preventing us from creating global norms. And even worse, due to biometrics' extraordinary innovative value, America's competitors as a global innovator will quickly wither the U.S. bans, a situation that will stifle economic growth and allow China to be superpower number one. It is thus not a question of if but when biometric technologies will become ubiquitous with our current modes of computing. What remains to be decided is whether that innovation will happen in the U.S. or on the other side of the world, where individual rights are not afforded the same level of respect. That is going to lament that China has begun exporting the deals all around the world using biometrics to pioneer a system that will stick theaters to watch citizens constantly and punish them instantly. J19 confirms if the United States is to stop Beijing from rewriting the international world order, we must win the innovation race. Thus, we get. Alright, cool. I'll start time right now. Go ahead. Alright, let's see. So, on healthcare, does having a high temperature mean you have COVID? Um, not necessarily, but our evidence isolates multiple other examples. For example, the Stewart evidence finds that it was biometric information that actually helped create the vaccine for COVID-19 because biometrics are things like your DNA, which is necessary to detect the protein structure of viruses right. and overall find cures. But also, there's other ways of contact tracing that do work. Right. Do countries like China have biometrics and use them to combat the COVID pandemic? Um, our steward evidence indicates that globally speaking, biometric development weren't implemented fully during the COVID-19 pandemic. But the steward evidence indicates that because of COVID-19, it has greatly spurred the biotech industry and has forced them to dramatically integrate biometrics. But if you want a few examples of times biometrics did work to combat COVID-19, Taiwan and Israel are good examples. Can I have a question? Sure, go ahead. So let's talk about your case, specifically on this idea about democracy free follow. Sure. So you give me the idea that if we ban biometrics, suddenly we'll have global regulations mm -hmm. that will stop biometrics from being sold everywhere. China is a surveillance state, and sure. they have never followed U.S. rules. Yeah. What gives you the idea that they'll follow U.S. rules simply because we ban biometrics sure. at home? So this isn't really an argument about China completely changing their government structure. What our inf what our argument is is that this is a power struggle for global influence between China and the United States. So we bring up countries such as Hungary, who are already moving towards authoritarianism with leaders like Viktor Orban. Our argument is that if we simply concede that we are going to use biometrics and allow China and us to drive this race further and further into a surveillance Orwellian state, then we are just going to end up with democracy decimated. What our argument is, is that it is not a game of you have to be in the game to win. Our argument is that if you, if we succumb to ch your argument and compete with China, compete with China, we are simply admitting, okay, biometrics are going to take over the world, a surveillance state is inevitable, we just want a slightly less bad surveillance state. Well, real quickly about this, the surveillance state is almost inevitable. That's true, because for, since the 1960s, almost every sure. single country has had surveillance. Biometrics yeah. is another tool in the toolbox that we say specifically is much better and much less intrusive than other forms of surveillance. But more importantly than that, the alternative to competing with China is bowing down to them and allowing them 
become a global superpower because of the innovative value by metrics. We, isn't that far worse for global norms if we aren't a superpower that can lead the world? We would disagree because being a global superpower is about sticking to your principles. The entire idea here is that if we don't ban biometrics, we are simply succumbing to these countries who are pushing us to become a more authoritarian state. We don't want to simply succumb to this pressure and say surveillance is inevitable, let's just let it happen. Our argument is that biometrics are the worst type of surveillance that's ever been created because of their sheer effectiveness at how much data they can gather about simply what you do in public. Daniel, I understand that sentiment, but while that might be true in theory, that isn't actually the best way we can solve this round. Because, for example, the United States must challenge China somehow, and saying we must stick to our principles has almost never worked. The U.S.'s strategy for making democracy happen throughout the world is compromising first back at home and making these competitive advantages so we can set global norms. Okay, so you, so just to be clear, we want to compromise on our democratic freedoms. At That's home. how we won every single right. conflict, including the Cold War. Okay. for putting on this great tournament. It's a really great opportunity that we get to come here and debate against a lot of our friends and the best people in California. Um, thank you to my parents. My mom is right there. She has come with us all the way across the head and has listened to us, has listened to me at least rant about debate for the better part of four years, which is cannot be easy at times. Um, both my parents have been there for me when debate has been well, when debate hasn't been well. Um, yeah, I'm really grateful for all this support you've given me. Also, thank you to my, just my family in general for putting up with us, like getting up at like 5 a.m. and yelling at a computer during Zoom, and maybe waking up the whole house. Um, thank you to our coaches, Kyle, Arjun, and Claire. They've all been great and supportive. Thank you to Carthy and Ethan, who are other pilots and debaters who have been watching our round, and who also had some great success of their own. Um, thank you to all of the teams that we've met on the circuit. I'm really sorry if I miss any. I think I got them all, but we'll see. Uh, MSJVP, WD, KK, Leland, Saratoga, JG, Science, we just made friends with them, they're all great yeah. people. Um, we've hit all of them in this tournament, which is interesting. Um, Notre Dame, BC, Doherty Valley, who we became friends with here, Midi, AD, uh, and then friends from camp, Ruth, Dine, Zach Watkins, you guys are great people, and I'm really glad for I met you. Uh, last, oh, and then the rest of Palo Alto, uh, Christy, Lucy, Sarah, Sophia, everybody else, the varsity and JV, you guys are all great and inspiration. It's been great doing with you guys. Um, last but not least, Daniel. I know it's been one year, but I mean, we've been through a lot, and it's been we've had we've had some success. Thank you for putting up with me when I'm slightly overbearing. Thank you for just tolerating me. Yeah. Um, and so for the last time, or one last last time ever, it'll just be straight down there, please. Is anyone not ready? Okay. On the first thing they tell you that biometrics are continuously being integrated in our society. Yes, they're being integrated, but we're going to go for the argument that the time is now to do a shift. If you wait any longer and you wait too far in the year, uh, it'll be far too integrated for us to actually make a shift. Right now is key. On their specific arguments, on the cancer and pandemics argument, there's a bunch of problems. One, the problem with preventative care was not technology. It's the fact that people rarely go seek preventative care in the first place. For instance, in places like rural hospitals and rural areas, people don't either have the A, funds to get there, B, means to get there, or C, the desire to go seek out preventative care in the first place. That's a prerequisite to any of their arguments because you can have the best technology in the world, but if people don't go to get the technology, you can't actually solve anything. Secondly, their study is terrible. It's literally 15 people in the United States. It has nothing to do with the United States, or in the U.S. UK, not the United States, it has nothing to do with the United States, and it's not a large enough sample size to actually indicate any proper progress. Third, on the pandemics argument, it's silly for a number of reasons. A, we've had biometrics for a number of years. We should not have seen COVID scale to the level that it was. B, countries like China that did implement biometrics had far worse COVID policies. C, um, the thing about temperatures is silly because it's not a biometric in the first place. A biometric is a unique physical identifier that temperature is not. Let's go to their next argument about counter-terror. A bunch of problems. One, the problem with drones, they tell you that the problem with drones is that bio they tell that biometrics help drones become better. The, the opposite is true. When you have biometrics and you have these so-called targeted drones, it's the opposite happens where you enables policymakers to justify more drone strikes because they're so-called accurate and there's no collateral damage. We would argue that in the world we're living in and where there's more and more pushback on people using drones in the United States, being in the Middle East, for example, they're withdrawing right now, there's going to be a natural decline. But if you give them things like biometrics, it allows them to 
continue and re-engage in the region under the guise of doing good with these precise drone strikes. Secondly, we would argue that surveillance fears actually are breathing, are, our evidence indicates that surveillance fears are the breeding ground for terrorism. There's a couple really crucial implications here. A, we would argue that because the United, because the government is going to be overtly surveilling their citizens, it polarizes terrorist groups even further because they believe they're being furtherly oppressed by the government, which leads them to lash out far more. B, it leads to more people joining terrorist groups because there's a higher anti-government sentiment because the government is intruding into their lives. And C, and most importantly, it short circuits any offense they can win here because if there's higher domestic terrorism in the United States, it forces the United States to focus their efforts in the United States as opposed to globally and other terrorists nas uh, on a global scale, which decreases our efforts overall. Third, our Loma 22 evidence that indicates that biometric data in the past to fight counterterrorism has been failures. That's because 4.8 million biometric records were stolen by the Taliban when they took over Afghanistan. That's terrible because the world they're advocating for where we use biometrics in the Middle East is terrible because if terrorists or anybody gains control of these biometrics, it's terrible as far as the empiric with the Taliban happened. When it happened, the Taliban used that data in order to go after US and US adjacent forces. Fourth, we would argue that because of a do because of a uh, data overload, it's not actually possible to do a lot of surveillance. It's not actually possible to do super targeted drone strikes. Let's go to the next argument on tech on this race. There's a bunch of problems. One, this idea that we can somehow set the norms with U.S. ideals is fundamentally impossible. It's because the I, the very uh, fact that we're using biometric surveillance it stands antithetical to what the United States stands for. If the United States is going to promote freedoms and civil liberties, then why would we be doing the exact thing that's going to be decimate civil liberties? That's absolutely silly. Secondly, the neg or secondly, we would argue that regulation is terrible. For example, it's inconsistent from state to state, which is leading to a lot of problems. For instance, there's small businesses that have to navigate legal troubles because the regulation in one state is different from another. That's terrible because our evidence indicates that there's been thousands and thousands of lawsuits that are crushing small businesses. As far as 60% of small businesses have to go bankrupt because of a lawsuit, and small businesses account for 50% of innovation. That's terrible because in their world with biometrics and these regulations that they are advocating for, there's very <coughs> inconsistencies, which leads to more lawsuits, which means that more small businesses being closed, which means there's less innovation on that. Lastly, the, the lastly, conceding to China and the tech race is the exact opposite of what they're talking about. It just creates a race to the bottom where each country gets more and more oppressive in order to out-oppress the other. Can I just get the evidence about small business? Yeah, sure. Okay. Alright, uh, I'll start with James really quickly. Uh, first, thanking Casa. Thanks for the tournament. It was great. Super fun. Um, next, my parents. My mom has like specifically helped me with so much with debate tournaments. She knows like all the teams on the circuit and theory and case because I talk about it so much and she always listens. So I really appreciate her for that. Also, Daniel's parents for hosting me every single weekend during COVID, which was about a year and a half of me being in his house, like literally every weekend. Um, I heard the zows. Um, in terms of our coaches, Coach Dalton for bringing us to every single tournament, managing flights, our entire team. Like I adore her so much. Maggie, who's one of my like friends, but a coach, she's provided so much like emotional support for us and taken us to TOC and all types of tournaments. Um, Anna and Coach S for being great PF helpers. Isaac Gutierrez, who taught Daniel and I how to do PF in the first place. He's like one of the most influential people in my life. And Gabe Gruden for always being there for every step of the way, calling us during tournaments and yeah, being a great role model. Um, in terms of other people, my best friends, Halia and Karina, have also been great support. And then in terms of people on the team, the Flint Ridge team, there's Hannah, Amanda, Daniel, Ava, Chase, Ben, Caitlin, Alex, Sam, Emma, Casey, Isaac, Finley, Rashad, and Arden. Every week, seeing those people for seven hours is the highlight of my time. Um, and the people who we prepped with, specifically on this topic, Caleb, Caleb Arnov, and Ahmad, and then Plano, and Brady Sophic, and American Heritage for being really close for the past like two or three years. Also, Palo Alto for hitting us around. Great meeting you last weekend, and I appreciated our week long friendship. Um, yeah, I don't know. I love everyone I've been on the circuit. Sorry if I didn't mention any of them. But finally, Daniel Zhao, who I love like a brother. People say that we fight like a married couple, but he's <laughs> probably the person in the world who knows me the most. So I will always value our friendship and partnership. Okay. With that being said, it'll be a quick overview on our arguments, and then I'll be talking about my uh, Ned case, and then my post arguments on the Atkins. Is anyone not ready? All right. The best way to determine if we need to ban biometrics is to look at our current world. 
and Yandouche finds that the U.S. prison population has declined 25 percent since 2009. In terms of authoritarianism, we've seen Brazilian voters oust Bolsonaro, Macron defeat far-right challengers Le Pen, Xi Jinping forced to abandon zero COVID, and Iran's regime still being rattled by a furious protest moving, movement, proving that even if some small democracies are becoming authoritarian, the big authoritarian countries are becoming democracies, proving an overall increase in democracy throughout the world. But finally, the portions have been decreasing. Shaw 23 finds that the number of ICE dropped significantly. In 2020, the agency deported 100,000 people, but in 2022, there were only 38,000, proving that there have been a decrease in deportion, deportations, and also proving that our current world of biometrics is not causing all these harms. In fact, it's responsible for a lot of the solutions that we are seeing right now. In terms of our arguments on innovation, my opponents start by saying that the time is now for a shift. We've had biometrics for 40 years. Why now? If anything, it just proves that we shouldn't be trying to get rid of biometrics because they're so heavily implemented into all of the United States society. On our argument about health, they give you a few responses, but a few things frontline it. They first concede that insofar as biometric treatment is a lot cheaper and it's a lot less invasive, it is more accessible to help people get access to healthcare in the first place. They also concede that giving an accuracy rate of 99.7% of one cancer trial is not our entire argument. Yes, that's true, but it's also about all the other kinds of, uh, of DNA testing and genetic testing to solve literally every kind of cancer that's necessary. They finally say that COVID didn't really have biometrics, but insofar as we've seen a heavy implementation of biometrics after COVID because we saw the importance of responding to pandemics, that's why the uniqueness is our future. On our arguments about terrorism, they first say that it justifies more strikes, but they can see that drone strikes and U.S. counterterrorism methods will happen no matter what. We should try to increase the highest amount of accuracy, and the best way to do that is with biometrics. They also try to say that the government is going to oppress terrorists. Terrorists are already mad at the U.S. If anything, it's better to catch them, which is why our evidence finds that they've caught 1,700 terrorists within the United States. They finally make a response about the Taliban. A, one example, two, no impact. One sentence doesn't count as a response. They finally say that there's a data overload. Why does that matter? When did that happen? How did that ho happen? Who said that? You should be asking all of yourself these questions. Finally, an argument about conceding the race. They just say that the U.S. isn't. You, the U.S. shouldn't endorse this. But if everyone is going to in the first place, the U.S. has to join the race in order to be able to beat them. And they finally say that the bunch of the regulations are going to cause small businesses to collapse the United States economy. One, why hasn't that happened? And second of all, the fact that U.S. innovation and increasing the status quo proves that these regulations are not only solving biometrics, but also increasing the accuracy and effectiveness of them. Let's go into their case. They start by saying that we should prioritize structural violence, but one, our arguments link into that too. A lack of healthcare access is a form of structural violence, so is oppression of Chinese authoritarianism, and so is being an innocent civilian being killed by terrorists. Ultimately, just because structural violence isn't in the U.S. doesn't mean it doesn't matter. On the arguments about mass incarceration, first, the Baker 22 evidence finds that all of their evidence is based on a 2012 study that actually, since then, biometrics have drastically improved, which is why Parker 22 finds that now, out of the top 150 algorithms, 99% they have a 99% accuracy. And what's worse is that if we didn't have biometrics, we'd be relying on humans once again, such as eyewitnesses, which Hoover 22 finds are 10 times more biased and unreliable. On the arguments about immigration, there's a few problems with their evidence. First, they're evidencing that biometrics will cause an increase of deportations, but their evidence about the increase is hypothetical and still hasn't happened despite it being 11 years later. And next, ICE still gets their data either way because data brokers empirically subvert bans. Auditing 22 writes that rather than obeying the law, ICE contracted with data brokers in the past to get backdoor access. The idea that they just wouldn't get an exemption from any kind of ban isn't, is true. On the idea of democracy, our argument really well responds to this because they concede that it is naive that other countries would stop all of their implement uh, uh, implementation of biometrics. They would just get it from China because if you have your biometrics in national security, in banking, and in healthcare, why would you leave all of that just because the United States stops? No, what you would do is start buying it from China, which is why it's key that the United States joins the race instead of trying to leave and give China more power to win it. Thank you. That's a strong vote for the negation. So, uh, we're going to run before the votes. Uh, we have one minute and 43 seconds, I believe. Yeah. All right, three, two, one.
So that means we had biometrics during the pandemic. Why weren't they used? Yeah, great question. Because the last pandemic happened over 100 years ago. No one ever really thought that would happen. That's why when they were like, I think it was like March 2020, and we were like, oh my gosh, online school, that's so fun. Because none of us took it seriously. But we saw how bad COVID was, and that's why the government has already started implementing better biometrics, okay. do solving things, and getting okay. more contact One, the So now I did a question. We've been okay. on that for a while. We've been on that for 20 seconds. Lawyers, I'm going to respond to that really quick. Okay. One, the fact that we went online in the first place in such a short time frame indicates that people were actually very scared of COVID. If we really thought that it was a frivolous disease and it didn't actually matter, they would not have canceled school, something that's, like, they would not have canceled school and moved it online for a year and a half. They did that, like, three months late, and they only thought they were going to move it online for two well, weeks. I think still, we can still, all agree the way the government handled COVID right. was not right, and the way you've that America conceded, responded though, to it was conceded, not the way that was thinking it was going to be that bad. China, it doesn't really matter. China, which used biometric data okay. to try to track cases, none which of, had terribly none of this really matters because it doesn't respond to the warranting that the reason why COVID was so bad proves that the United States has already started implementing better biometric systems, whether or not we believe that COVID was bad or responded to no, well. No, Can no, I no. get a question? Yes. Okay. When has the U.S. ever followed their word in terms of foreign policy? What do you mean by that? Like, can you give me a single example of the time that the government has said they were going to do something to, like, protect the people or do something for democracy, and then they actually do it? I don't know. That's, like, a pretty abstract question. I'm not sure if I can, like, give you a specific example. What about, but like, foreign I would... policy or, like, during a war? I don't know. I can't give you a single example, but that doesn't really matter. What we're telling you on your second contention is that, yes, these, is that biometric surveillance is being used to oppress citizens. And then what you say, what Daniel told you in First Cross, is where you're going to concede some of what our democratic values are in order to yeah. fight with China. It becomes like a race of oppression where each country just starts to out-oppress the other, which are You're significantly worse oversimplifying the scenario. We can't just say, oh, we're a democracy, we're only going to do good things. And even if we as debaters want that to happen, that's not going to happen. Well, what is sure, going to happen the same way with the thing we saw during the Cold War, which is what Daniel gives you examples of. In our fight to fight communism, the way the United States did it was oppressing anyone who was right. subversive in right. a way that we all became like okay. so similar, everyone having okay. like the same houses, okay. proving that a lot of times what we're trying to fight, we become, and that's the only way to beat the other. Okay. One, we would argue that biometric surveillance is a far worse tool of oppression than anything we've done in the past because it enables- What about to... genocide? That's like, obviously genocide is bad. Okay, what we're okay. saying is the biometrics, like, <laughs> the whole point is that the idea that biometrics are like the worst thing to exist isn't true, and the, well, no, no, the point not, is you can use them in the right way. For example, well, other countries no, use biometrics in election to monitor election security to bolster democracy, mm -hmm. and the United States has used it for law enforcement, healthcare, terrorism. Yes, we have proved, used it in law enforcement, where it disproportionately targets. Okay, well that's a different debate. The Parker Twenty Two evidence disagrees, enough. but that is how just because something's accurate doesn't mean it fixes the structural problem. All right, everyone ready? Time to begin my first word. Great. Starting on the overview, we would argue now is the time to combat biometrics because they are simply being integrated in every sector of the economy which they hadn't done in the past. In addition, on the structural violence framework, we have more specific arguments to structural violence as opposed to vague Lincolns. Our arguments disproportionately affect people in the United States who are subverted to a second class citizenship, and let's go into that. Onto our first argument about mass incarceration. They simply talk about the prison population declining. We'd argue this is simply because of COVID-19, where people could not be in prisons. We'd argue that the prison population is increasing now specifically because of biometrics. In addition, they say that biometrics are accurate. This simply doesn't matter. Our argument is that the police are a racist system in the United States, and biometrics allows them to massively expand their influence into great sectors. This means that people are going to be arrested for small crimes like jaywalking, possession of marijuana, etc., which is going to put them in the system and lead them to a cycle in the system. The reason police can't do this as effectively now is because they don't have as much police officers. But with biometric technology, they don't need police officers whatsoever. They only need a mugshot. They say that relying on eyewitnesses is worse. In the alternative, we wouldn't rely on eyewitnesses. We'd simply rely on things like CCTV, which are human monitored and therefore require police to check them, but aren't as invasive as biometric technology. Remember that structural violence leads to death and 60,000 people die every year due to structural inequality, which we are combating. On to our second contention about immigration and custom enforcement. They said deportations are decreasing right now. Remember, this is just because of Biden's new rules. However, the second Biden loses and a Republican comes into office, they're going to abuse these biometrics because ICE is simply expanding their reach three times in the next couple years, which means 
De deportations are increasing massively in this, it will increase massively in the status quo. This is extremely important. They say that they're ICE is simply going to subvert the ban. We need to do as much as we can in order to ban ICE and allow the justice system to take advantage of this and regulate ICE's use of biometric technology. There are currently zero regulations. Remember that this is going to lead to people being abused in the prison system of ICE deportation and it's going to lead to collapse of many families who are going to be separated. On to our third contention about democracy. They see that the regimes are declining right now. They cherry pick random examples, whereas we give you hungry Egypt and Rwanda as all examples of democratic democracies that are backsliding, and we give you the overall empiric that the amount of democracies becoming authoritarian is greater than the reverse. This is because of biometric technology, and the United States is exporting, this is the second larger, ex largest exporter of biometric technology to these oppressive regimes. We need to stop that. Remember that countries want credibility, and they want foreign aid from the United States as well as foreign assistance. They will change if we change. Remember, we are only enabling these authoritarian governments, and authoritarian governments have killed millions of people over the years, and we are an, a democratic nation. On to innovation, onto healthcare. Remember that they considered the fact that people simply may not have the transportation or the desire to attend preventative healthcare. Biometric technology is simply making the technology healthcare more expensive and limiting the amount of people who have access to it. Remember the temperature is not a biometric, so we can't use it to solve pandemics. On counterterrorism, they completely missed the turn that terrorists are being uh, breeded domestically by things like surveillance. Think about uh, think about the Ruby Ridge shootout and domestic terrorism in the past. The reason people commit domestic terrorism is because they think the government is overreaching in things like surveillance. So surveillance is only going to make uh, terrorism worse. And remember that the Taliban led to, Taliban leaking biometrics led to 4.8 million people into China. We need to uh, fight these regulations abroad. People are going to look to the U.S. on what to do, and we need to tell them that we need to not use surveillance. It's a race to the bottom. Okay. Well, thank you, Rob. We'll set that down. Jeez, one more second. Eight more seconds. We're just going to be um, the ch conceding the race argument, and then I'll sign those from there. But I'll stay on the next one for a while. Okay. Anyone not ready? Perfect. In my opponent's last speech, they fully conceded our contention to about conceding the race. The round is over. Our argument is simply that regulation can solve all the problems that they talk about in their case. Our Crawford evidence indicates that currently we're seeing massive amounts of regulations that are making it so there is less mass incarceration. These deportations are happening less, and democracy is overall increasing. Specifically, the FRN evidence indicates that we're overall making it so the ethicality concerns of biometrics are decreasing, and they're seeing more transparency within biometrics, which is solving their own arguments. However, many biometrics will allow China to beat us in the innovation race specifically because they can see that biometrics will be implemented into every piece of modern technology, including banking, artificial intelligence, lethal autonomous weapons, and almost every part of our technology, which will specifically make it so if we even biometrics, China wins the tech race and becomes a global superpower. And what they can see this happens is when China becomes a global superpower, they set a demo autocratic model to every single other country, meaning that every country becomes autocratic, just like the US saw after World War II when we became the global power and set democracy standards across the entire world. At this point, their only potential cross-application of this argument is their own idea that democracy is currently in free fall, but what they can see is first, our Walsh evidence, which also indicates that there was a positive trajectory of democracy, democracy is actually increasing, and second, and more importantly, that the biggest authoritarian countries are becoming democratic, which is more important, because now that the Siena gives you that they commit the most atrocities, the most violence, and the most conflicts against humans, the human race. With that being said, this argument is extremely easy to vote for, because it also leads to the oppression that they talk about, because autocracies do things like mass incarcerations, reject refugees, and overall oppress their people on a much faster scale than the United States would ever do, which means that it isn't a choice between biometrics or no biometrics, it's a choice between Chinese biometrics and U.S. biometrics, and you're always voting for U.S. biometrics in this round. With that being said, the second argument you can vote for us on is our argument about counterterrorism. The argument is also extremely clean that right now we're implementing biometrics into counterterrorism to make so drone strikes are much more accurate, saving hundreds of thousands of people and overall reducing terrorism by 38%, which is a conceded empiric. We've also caught 1,700 terrorists. They give you two responses. The first response that terrorism is being breeded um, but because of biometrics. But first of all, no quantification where they can see that overall terrorism has decreased 38% because of biometrics, meaning that we outweigh. Their second response is this Afghanistan argument telling you that we got Af our information stolen, but there also isn't an impact to this argument. That was a one off situation because we had a missed pull out of Afghanistan, but the majority of the situation shows for all drone strikes is that we're rapidly reducing terrorism and seeing positive trajectories of change to the point where we save millions of lives because we reduce terrorism in the Middle East, which is the bigger link into their argument about structural violence because they can see that these terrorists specifically oppress the people in these other countries and that these global lives do matter a lot too. With that being said, let's go to their case. 
on their mass incarceration and had to extend the eyewitnesses term that tells you that overall eyewitnesses are 10 times more biased. Their only response they relied on CCTV instead, but they have conceded specifically our evidence finds that the worst type of incarcerations are misconvictions specifically because you're going to jail for something you're not justly going to jail for, which is what our evidence finds that morally speaking, this is the most important argument. On the deportations argument, they have conceded our evidence finds that ICE will subvert um, the ban and just go to other data brokers that's not the government and do it illegally. They say we need to regulate ICE, but they concede that ICE doesn't listen to regulations, which it doesn't matter. And finally, the democracy, they have conceded that overall, the Biden people is from China instead of the United States, which means that there will always be authoritarianism. The contention to is conceded it is round over. Right. Can I have a quick question in Grant? Sure. Right. Can we just like agree that these democracy, like this, demo our democracy contention and your China contention are the same? Because like you functionally concede our democracy contention, and I like just cross. <coughs> we both cross apply like the democracy well, responses on both sides. First and foremost, our authoritarianism argument serves yeah. as a prerequisite to argument. These are two things. The first thing is you can see it is all the regulations evidence. We read four okay. cards about regulations, and that's not responsive to the last page. Okay. Okay. But second, and I think much more importantly, is we read a spike in our case. We say specifically yeah. from the BI evidence, which is, by the way, a very good piece of evidence, that says that if the US bans biometrics, it isn't like every other country will follow us, will set global norms. And the reason for that is our evidence finds that the US doesn't have enough credibility okay. in the global sphere as of now because of China's advantage that no one will listen right. to our ban. Right. So okay. the crucial thing that you missed out of Daniel's summary is he gave an actual warrant for why other countries have to listen to the United States. That's because the United States is one, A, the primary hegemon, B, sends foreign aid to a lot of countries. So if you're a country that is receiving foreign aid from the United States and you don't align with their values, you're going to lose that foreign aid, which is an independent incentive. I'm, 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 I'm perfect, that's a perfect example of two warrants that our chain have specifically talks about. Both those have things. China can also provide. China can provide foreign aid. China can provide this, all these allyships. And more important than that, they can just buy biometrics from China. All these things are not supplied by the United States. First of all, that what that wasn't that wasn't really clearly extended in summary. Second of all, China can't simply provide foreign aid to every single country globally. First of all, this is I mean this is new because this is on, new on both sides. But like most of China's foreign aid is in the form of loans, as opposed to the United States foreign aid, which is I direct think, grants. I think we're getting so, too into the nitty okay. like parts but, of this argument. But the right. general idea is that if a country has biometrics implemented into nearly every sector of their economy and society, right. they're not just going to drop all of them and leave all of that technology and have the entire okay. private and public sector drop it because. The United States does. Okay. Can we get a I mean, we can we can contest that, but can we agree okay. these arguments are functionally question? similar? Yeah. Can we get a question? Okay, we can get a question. Yeah. Okay. So on the idea of prison, like mass incarceration increasing sure. or decreasing, so like how much you're saying it's been increasing? How much has it been increasing in the past like, few years? It's not about the past few years. The point is that COVID massively disrupted any statistics about mass incarceration. Our argument is that yeah. during COVID, like most. Across the aisle, politicians agreed that we can't have so many people in jail for minor crimes, so there was a temporary pause on mass incarceration. What we're going to argue is that this cannot be captured by data since it's so recent, but what we're arguing is that the mass incarceration trends of the early 2000s and late 90s are now resuming because of the recent crackdown on crime. Yeah, politicians so in major big cities are... Go Huh? What piece of evidence says that? Because right now you're making a lot of assertions and basing all of your evidence off of a 30-year yeah. study, but we shouldn't be looking at holistic trends well, here. Well, why should we be looking at a 10-year study that was disrupted by COVID either? Uh, for a few reasons. First, it's significantly more recent. If we're talking about what's happening with the U.S., domestic policy changes like very often, so looking at a 30-year trend of, ma of mass incarceration isn't going to solve your problem. Looking at a more specific recent study is. And you also, uh, also, what were you saying about the pandemic? Oh, yeah, also, um, in the past month, we've also seen a um, continuous decrease in mass incarceration, and it's post-COVID policy. Okay. <laughs> Would you but agree that major cities, okay, we can cover that. Okay, I wasn't going to check how much cover there. Uh, I counted for you, you're at 244. Okay. Um, I want to, starting prep, no. about democracy, and then I'll go to terror in that case. Cool. Okay. Anyone not ready? In 
their last speech, the only response that Daniel extends is that there's somehow, like, we, there's a moral imperative to not do misconvictions. They conceded the fact that eyewitnesses aren't actually used and that you use CCTV footage, which means that there will be no, there probably will be no uh, misconviction. But more importantly, they conceded in every speech the cyclical nature of facial recognition, facial recognition. That's because when people are arrested for minor offenses, they get entered into the database and their mugshot gets used to scan through thousands and thousands of videos. That's crucial because, because minorities are more, are disproportionately arrested for minor offenses. It means that they are disproportionately scanned for in all of these, are uh, disproportionately scanned for in all of these databases. That's completely conceded in every single speech. Our evidence indicates that these disproportionate effects kill 60,000 people a year. The only response that they can go for in their final focus is this thing about misconvictions, and it's silly. It doesn't, it completely misses the mark. The ground is 1,000% over. It's also the only fully terminalized impact. On our on global democracy, the only thing they tell you is that there's democracies that are increasing, that the major players are increasing. No, they're not. The United States is becoming more authoritarian as we speak, and they're implementing more oppressive policies, too. They can see the overall analysis that at a global macro level, there's more backsliding democracies than ever. Yes, there may be few minor uh, examples of people that are doing good, but that doesn't mean that the overall trend is incredibly bad. They remember that uh, remember that the United States is used as a baseline for how other countries should act in the world because of things like foreign aid. I'll address their response in a Second, but and what, when the United States starts enacting oppressive and oppressive policies, it's terrible because it greenlights other authoritarian states to do this. This means that there's going to be an increase in uh, oppressive states which kill hundreds of millions of people. They just tell you that China can fill in for foreign aid, but no, they can't because countries don't want China's foreign aid because there's debt trap diplomacy and it comes with debt and strings attached. The United States foreign aid is far preferable on terrorism. They've conceded a couple things. Both terms are just conceded. They've conceded the fact that uh, uh, biometrics breed terrorism. They just say there's no quantification, but they've conceded all of the implications that A, it further polarizes people and B, it increases terror. On the race to the bottom, they've conceded out of rebuttal that regulations are inconsistent from state to state, which makes them wholly ineffective, that short circuits any of their offenses, it, it, it short circuits any of their offenses, the regulations never actually solve for any of the problems they talk about. Daniel, I have a minute and 21 seconds of prep left. The best argument in this round is our argument about China. Insofar as countries around the world are implementing biometrics into all of their data systems, and the United States banning biometrics wouldn't do anything to make them stop their implementation. They're already too, we, too much. We can't turn back now. But what countries are going to do if the United States bans biometric technology is start getting this technology from China, which allows China to not only spread their bad biometrics that endorse uh, things like concentration camps within China and a heavy surveillance state, but it also increases authoritarianism and endorses it for the entire world, which does a few things. First, my opponents can see that this links into all of their arguments and better. Because if we see more and more countries authoritarian around the world, then it means more oppression on a larger scale in every single country, not just the United States. That means more oppression of minorities the way that they talk about in the United States, but everywhere else, which not only outweighs on scope, but proves that authoritarianism is the most important. My opponents are going to try to tell you a few things. They first try to say that regulations are inconsistent. One, not a single response was made to China in summary, at which point this isn't responded to. But second of all, they can see that the fact that innovation is increasing in the status quo disproves the idea that regulations being inconsistent is so bad. If it's true that we are currently seeing a world of increased democracy because they can see that the biggest countries are becoming democratic, not authoritarianism, then those bigger countries mean a lot more because bigger countries have a lot more weight in the global scale. Countries like France, Iran, Russia, and China have significantly more weight, and if they become democratic, it proves overall that the United States is going to be, is going to be the only one that can ruin this. At that point, let's go on to my opponent's arguments. They try to make this argument about mass incarceration, but we're winning this too, because they concede in their last speech that mass incarceration is overall decreasing. If they try to say it's been increasing for the past 30 years, more recently, it's been decreasing, which proves that biometrics themselves are not responsible for causing this big change that's gonna cause, uh, that's gonna cause incarceration to increase, or their cyclical impacts. If anything, this just proves that the best way to vote is negation, because banning biometrics will allow China to take the race and will increase incarceration in a way that makes all of their arguments happen on a worse scale. Thus, thank you, please negate. Thank you.